From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again. Welcome to Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis with a stellar panel here today. We've got a lot to discuss, and um, I think we should just get right to it and introduce who's here because we have Natalie Moore with us from WBEZ, Chicago Public Radio, and uh, uh, Southside Bureau Chief, Executive Director of the Southside <laughs> Bureau there. We have Kitty Kurth with us, a political, well, political, well, we never even talked about what we're going to call you. You're a political consultant, political, political consultant, animal, public relations, political public animal. Is yeah, probably yeah. most Just sort of, appropriate. If it's political and it's in Chicago, her thumbprints are in it somewhere. Andy <laughs> Shaw is also with us today. You know Andy, of course, longtime Channel 7 person, and um, also now, I think much more importantly, the head of the BGA and a guy who is kind of single handedly retooling the BGA and doing a terrific job. Much more importantly? Yes, I think so. Tell my wife that when she looks at <laughs> the paycheck. <laughs> it's, it's more important than being a reporter on TV now, Andy. Okay, Come on. I'll buy that. So here's the thing I was at uh, last Last night, I was at the um, the forum on education. You happen to be the moderator of that, and I got to tell you, people who are familiar with this show know that I tend to be a little cynical about things, and sometimes I open with a sarcastic remark about something. Last night, all of that kind of washed away a little bit because um, it was a kind of a it was a genteel, intelligent discussion about the future of education with four really bright people who all are products of the Chicago Public Schools, who were respectful of one another, of the city, and I just was kind of pinching myself thinking, is, <laughs> is, this, this, Chicago? is, this, Chicago, is this Chicago politics? Well, you know, as I said last night, uh, I was thrilled to moderate. I was also thrilled to see something we haven't had in Chicago for more than two decades, a wide open mayor's race and a vigorous debate on public issues among a group of people all of them well-educated and well-qualified, sitting side by side, going at it in a, in a courteous way in front of a live audience in a Chicago neighborhood. And, and that's the sort of thing that we need desperately to yeah. make this a democratic election. Well, you made that, so that point. Was great. You made that point at the conclusion last night, and I was in complete agreement with you. Now, this is the, not exactly the most high-tech way of doing it. Andy, I know when you were at Channel 7, you could just roll in the clip, but here... <laughs> roll I'm the video. Gonna, <laughs> I'm going to just play for you my digital recording from last night. Let's see if I can play Why that. Not give families a choice. It's just like we have Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T. We have McDonald's. We have Wendy's. The United States Post Office did not get better until you had uh, UPS and FedEx. Then all of a sudden, the United States Post Office stepped up its game. So what's wrong with letting kids have a voucher? I bet you that would make the public school system better. I don't think I need to tell you who that was. That was James Meeks. And you picked one of the two best sound bites of the night. Meeks defending this plan to give parents uh, vouchers to send their kids to whatever school they want to. Yeah. This was a program he suggested in Springfield. You know, he's a state senator right. along with the right. Reverend. He suggested it in Springfield as a pilot program. It passed the Senate and never got a vote in the House, and he's brought it back as a proposal now. His theory is that with so many failing inner city schools, it makes sense to give parents choice. Now, vouchers are anathema to teachers' unions mm -hmm. because they feel it's an assault on public education. And to the and, other three candidates. And the vouchers can be used in private and parochial schools. As a result, they feel a little deplete the already minimal resources of public right, education. Right. So that's a wedge issue and a divisive issue in this well, race. He's the only one of the four that is really aggressively in favor of that. It was a really interesting moment last night because the uh, the audience went really pretty crazy. They went wild. Well, the only forward. crazier moment was the bizarre topic of TIFFs. <laughs> yes. I, you probably have a TIFF quote in there, too. <laughs> yeah. T I tell well, people 10 years ago, no one even knew right. it. I thought a tiff was a row between a couple of people, yeah, yeah, yeah. and now all of a sudden, and tiff now you has can entered. Get applause. Yeah. You can get the biggest applause line of the night it's by saying, and it's time to, to bust, bust up, up these the tiffs. Or it's time to make them transparent right. and put them right. online yeah. because right. they're the mayor's uh, right. private slush right. fund. Right. That's become a famous line. But it was, I, I will get off of this because I know we got a million sure. things to talk about, but, but it was just really interesting to me last night to see 
a, a really kind of rational debate going on between some candidates who who really seem to care about this issue and are engaged and have. And let me just say one last thing. The only part <laughs> about it that I that I felt a little disappointed about was that Rahm Emanuel chose not to attend. By the time this week is over, there will have been three forums yes. around the city. Uh, on Tuesday night at UIC, one sponsored by 30 community groups. Last night's by three groups moderated by me. Tonight, the Chicago Teachers Union is having an education forum, and he is skipping all three. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to criticize him by name for a tactical decision that may be why politically but I will say it's disappointing when you start your campaign in a public school when you identify education as the key issue and when you pledge to empower parents when you have a chance to go in front of a group of parents mm -hmm. in a neighborhood side by side with your opponents in an unscripted format and you don't show up then people can legitimately question your your style and tactics in running for mayor and the way you'll be as mayor and I think that's a legitimate concern and, and that's question. what I wanted who, to bring up the, too yeah and who were the for the the candidates that did show up. Del Valle, Chico, Mosley, Braun, and Meeks. Meeks. And, and Meeks. Danny Davis couldn't make it because he had a vote in Congress. I mean, he legitimately and was mm -hmm. in Congress. I will say one thing. The sponsors set the bar high. You had to have 25,000 signatures on your nominating petitions because mm -hmm. the polling has been so inconclusive. Yeah. They didn't want 15 candidates, so they used the signature level as mm -hmm. a way of determining who were the most serious candidates. And I think in a way it's bad because people were omitted in a way it's good yeah. because with with a small group you could get some good dialogue well I'll come going. down on that side yeah. that it was really interesting to yeah. spread out a little bit and let some folks have, you know, have their say. Uh, we're we're not working with any candidate in the mayor's race but we did work with Carol Mosley Braun in the presidential campaign and what always um, well it didn't you know surprise me but it, you know, it, di it did in a pleasant way at the first debate she is so good on issues that when we working with men, male candidates over the years you would have to spend 20 have 20 people with briefing books briefing somebody for two days with Carol Mosley Braun preparing her for debates was talking to her for yeah. a half an hour which of the issues are you going to talk about and I think that having her in the debate will raise the level of civility mm. and mm. the level of Edu and at the level of the issues content because she is good on issues and what we saw in the presidential debates the guys were much less likely to take big jabs at each other when <laughs> there was a woman as one of the debaters. There's Kitty Kareth introducing gender into the discussion <laughs> and Natalie, we, we, we cut you off you were sorry. sorry. No no I was just wondering how Rahm Emanuel's decision not to do any debates I think he said he's going to do um, one debate sponsored by the City Club Channel 11 how that's going to play out uh, what was the reaction of the audience? And there are plenty of debates that are coming up, and these aren't jack leg no, groups. These Natalie, are I think he's going to end up. I think he's actually going to end up doing two or three debates and a couple of forums. I think his feeling is that by the time we pay close attention to the election in late January and early February, and by the time there's a debate on Channel 7, which I think he'll participate in, uh, TTW, and maybe one on the radio, people will forget the ones he didn't do. And in the meantime, he'll avoid being beaten up by contenders who see him as a front runner and therefore want to use him a bit as a punching bag. I think he'd rather uh, avoid that for the time being. It's a tactical decision that may be wise politically, but certainly in that audience last night there were a lot of disappointed people who wished he had been there and and, but, and as a head of a better government group I can say process wise that that it's a it's a more vigorous and democratic process when you do show it up. It was so interesting yeah. that his name was not mentioned once not tangentially at all was, he was, he was, but he was I in thought the one of the candidates would take off on him yeah, I, that yeah. surprised me more than anything. Okay folks let's we can we can very easily spend the whole half right. hour talking about this let's move on although I do think we do have to just bring this issue up very briefly a lot of the commentators the pundit class uh, the punditocracy after watching the 12 hour uh, <laughs> inquisition uh, commented that this really cemented it for Rahm Emanuel that that uh, this was the moment when uh, when he wins the election we're gonna look back and say that was the day that he won it because he was kind of presidential mayoral or something and and he he presented himself very well and uh, and people are going to look at that and say that's the guy I want. I don't think do voters you, are, are I, even care yeah, about this. This is such a red herring. Anybody <laughs> except us and our friends actually watched any of that? I mean seriously. <laughs> I think well, the public, I'll admit to question. streaming it. I'll admit to streaming <laughs> it but I don't think any voters watched it. I don't 
And it's such a distraction from the issues. If the issue around Rahm Emanuel is only his residency, mm -hmm. then there's no debate around where he stands on the issues. Yeah, yeah. And, and that to me is, is really a disservice. Well, say, that's say, why I think not participating in the debates, to me as a voter, it's a, it's that's a really mistake. annoying. Because I, mean, I, I don't know how he feels about any of these things. I don't know how Rom feels about but, vouchers. But Kitty, I think it's less about, I think we're eventually going to know where he stands on everything because he is going to issue enough position papers and have enough news conferences, enough TV ads. What I think is important is to take the measure of a person side by side uh, with the other candidates. You mentioned the presidential race, and I've covered all of them going mm -hmm. back to the 80s. You know, in presidential debates and primaries, everybody shows up. Right. Hillary and Barack came to every debate even knowing that a number of people on that stage would only be around for a few more weeks. It's respect for the process and that's the part that bothers and, me. You've got to respect the voters and the sponsors and you should show up. Not only that, it makes you a better candidate. Absolutely. It makes you understand what people care about. It makes you be right. more into well, there, the Well, there are two, two things that I just, two random quick thoughts that, that occurred to me last night. The first is that I, I just really thought last night particularly that, that Emmanuel really missed an opportunity. I mean, it, this was a great presentation by some very smart people, and by not being there, he looks a little cowardly. But that, 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 that as mm -hmm. I think you've said, Andy, that'll go away. He, yep. he, that, that's not an issue. The other random thought was, Oh my God, no matter who wins this thing, it's going to probably be one of these mm -hmm. five or six people. We're going to have a mayor who is going to stand up at the podium and articulate big issues and actually... <laughs> Talk about I don't want things. to finish the sentence. I, I was once employed by Mayor Daly, so and I, I was going to call you yeah. on that issue of acting mayoral. <laughs> if you if you act mayoral in Chicago, you pitch some sort of a fit. Right. So right. last night, I think the term presidential works better, not gubernatorial, <laughs> because then you'd be like Blagojevich. So presidential's your right. only that's your only modifier. So, well, anyway. <laughs> It's going to be a different kind of a character Absolutely. standing up, looming over the podium than we've grown up with in the last 20 years. That we can say for sure. All right. What do you want to talk about? What else is going on? You in the had a long list. Time? I got a huge <laughs> list here. We could talk. We, maybe we should uh, sort of wa work our way down. Let's talk about the county. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have a new uh, president of the county board, and uh, she has been... She's been, she's come in rather quickly, but she's talking about, uh, Tony Preckwinkle talking about 21% cuts in, in uh, public defender, state's attorney, the sheriff's office. Eric Zorn was opining about that the other day, that it can't be done. 250,000 defendants a year go through the public defender's office. They've already been cut by 30% over the last couple of years. There's a lot of reform that can happen, especially at the sheriff's office. A couple of weeks ago, we saw the Settled. They paid out about $55 million in strip search cases. The press didn't actually go all the way back on those cases. If you look at the total, it's about $80 million, which could have been settled when we, when some colleagues, lawyers that we work with brought the first case back in the late 90s. They, the settlement then required that the sheriff's department stop the process, put in screens and stuff so that the strip searches could be done in a constitutional fashion. The sheriff's department bought the equipment and didn't install it. They kept doing things wrong. Eighty million dollars later, we're suffering. The kinds of things that need to be implemented at county government are not just cutting personnel, but making sure that things actually happen. Mm -hmm. Not that people just talk about it, but you know, and many things, especially at the jail. Um, I applaud Sheriff Dart for getting good press on the things he's doing well, but there's a lot of things over there that still need to be fixed. So your conclusion then is that there is maybe there's uh, there's a lot, a of, lot money of money that, money that can, can be, be saved, saved there, okay. not right. only by cutting personnel though, but by making the personnel that are there actually do their jobs. Well, Ken Dart's, I mean not Dart, uh, Eric Zorn's point was that uh, a categorical 21 percent across the board may be impossible because some services are more critical than mm -hmm. others, and some mm -hmm. are more manpower intensive. Right. His right. point was state's attorney sheriff and public defender mm -hmm. have tasks that involve public safety and justice that may be a lot more difficult 
to perform if you have to take a 21% hit because there's a client base that must be served directly. It's a lot different than five PR people sitting in the president's office, one of them with a real yeah. job, four yeah. sitting in desks. So I'll, I think... <laughs> <laughs> Why, Andy? I'm Are not you putting down PR the profession of public <laughs> relations. <laughs> Kitty's one of my favorites. I guess my point's this. But she doesn't work for the My point is this, that 21% is a good target but there may be places like the Cook County Highway Department where 40% could be mm -hmm. cut or bureaucratic areas where one person could do two uh, menial or clerical jobs and you could say 40 to 50%, others may be only able to sustain well, 10%. And, and, and off I, after think more than that, so. I think more than that, what they really need to look at is the private contracts that, you know, while you have state's attorneys right. and public defenders, then they're also hiring outside counsel mm -hmm. to defend the sheriff's right, office, right, for example, right. to defend the county board. Let's look at some of those easy to, you know, a right. million dollars to X, Y, or Z law mm -hmm. firm. I think we really need to look at some of those, totally. that spending as yeah. well. Yeah. Not it's, just it's difficult whenever someone gives a target number and says across the board cuts mm -hmm. because there are so many variables. Right. But I think she's taking this hard stance because of the previous administration. She wants to come in and show that she's cutting away, she's cutting corruption. And she made this promise that she's going to roll back that sales tax. So where do you make that money up from? And you've got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. You've got to start. Well, it's, it's, it's certainly, certainly a refreshing change to see uh, <laughs> to see this kind of energy coming from the top uh, instead of from commissioners and 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 I think newspaper as she or, and I think as she looks at the different departments in county government, she'll find a lot more that can be mm -hmm. cut as well. But mm -hmm. it's refreshing to see her willing to stand there and take a stance and say, "We're going to look at this and we're going to do this and we're going to do this right." I, I do think one thing that that. Um, if you try to take a sort of a, of a very long historic look at this, you, you can only come to the conclusion that over the last 50 or 60 or 70 years, the city of Chicago has very carefully and judiciously sh sloughed off to the county all of the things that it doesn't want to do. Health care, <laughs> jailing people, you know, running the courts. It just, I mean, I know a lot of that is traditional, but this this is not just something that just happened when Todd Stroger came along. This is this is a long-standing issue of dumping all the patronage in the county so you can kind of hide it in this other government, this alternate government, and it's not going to get fixed very quickly, I think. Um, in the interest of just trying to move along really quickly, we we asked Natalie to come on the program. Uh, actually, we've wanted to get you on for a couple of weeks because of a really excellent piece that you did uh, a few weeks ago about food deserts in Chicago. And the, the things that you found, and I, I mean, I have a number of the things written down here that, that, that there are 2,200 authorized retailers in Chicago who, this is, this is, food stamps, right? Right. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the term is link card here, link but, card. but food yeah. stamp is the, the layman's term. But of those, 14% of them are gas and li gas stations and liquor stores, and another 15% are basically dollar stores. And pharmacies. And pharmacies. Mm -hmm. And among those, the non-compliance rate with the federal law is just through the roof. So you have a huge amount of, of money being spent on Cheetos and Pepsi. And, and it's not the fault. I mean, New York is about to is thinking about banning um, soft drinks for food stamp recipients. I don't know if that's the way to go. You know, you can argue a lot of things aren't good for you. My point is that what is being offered. Uh, I've done a lot of stories on on food desert issues, but I wanted to look at the data. You know, what what motivates or drives people beyond the fact that they live in a food desert. And so, if your choice is a liquor store or a gas station, and my office is in Inglewood, so I work in a food desert. Mm -hmm. I know this very well. And mm -hmm. there is a gas station down the street that has a link card in it, and there is nothing perishable that's sold in there. In fact, you can't even walk into the gas mm -hmm. station. Mm -hmm. It's all plexiglass, and you know, I'm looking, I just happen to be getting gas, and I'm looking, and there was nothing in there. So there isn't a lot of compliance. There's not a lot of oversight. Um, from the federal government on this. Um, they're looking more at fraud, people who are not supposed to be using mm -hmm. food stamps mm -hmm. or who are, you know, pawning them off on other people or selling them, but this will go a long way. Now, there have been some inroads, some places you can use uh, your link card for farmer's markets. 
but mm -hmm. if those aren't in your neighborhood, if they're not there, yeah. Yeah. right? Well, yeah. you know, Natalie, that that was the subtext of this whole Walmart debate. Even though on the surface the Walmart debate was against uh, poor employee policies when it came to salary and benefits, one of the things Walmart promised that I thought was perhaps most beneficial was was, was food. the food store component because it took actually uh, a grocery into those communities. And the sad thing is. Only a retailer like Walmart, which keeps its costs down and can do business at very low margins, uh, can afford to go into some of those communities, and that's why there was such uh, strain over the over the the salary and benefit issue. But I always thought if they could bring some food stores into those communities, see, the, the they would perform a huge service. The flip yeah. side, the west side, is a lot different than 83rd and Stewart. And I think Walmart was manipulating that story by calling it a food desert. And if you have reporters who don't know the South Side, mm -hmm. who don't mm -hmm. come down there, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, it's not in Chatham. I grew up in Chatham. Chatham is not a poor. Just because you're black does not yeah. mean you're yeah. poor. Yeah. So you're Chatham, saying that Chatham the argument at 83rd and Stewart wasn't a legitimate <laughs> no. one when it came to food. No. It might have been legitimate but for retail and sales side, tax and on all On the yeah. west side. But and, you also have. There are other parts of the south side that are food deserts that they could have come and put away. Now, Roseland, I think that that was mm -hmm. a, a better argument. But Walmart is mm -hmm. a company that wants to do business here. Yeah. And they're going to say what they need to say. But that was a disingenuous argument that they made about. Oh, this is a food desert. It's not. Now, is there a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's? Could it be better served? Absolutely. Is it a food desert? No. But, you know, Thank you. here's, here's <laughs> one of the things that a new mayor could be looking at, too, mm -hmm. is not how to bring in, not how to only bring in giant corporations like Walmart, but how to start more local businesses. And why shouldn't there be locally owned grocery stores in the areas where there are food deserts and people wanting to start businesses but not being encouraged to but start here's the, businesses? But here's the thing, and Natalie, can, you can speak for yourself on this, but, but I mean, the, the thing that I took away from your report is that there are are small businesses in the area and they're they're hooked with the link card but they're not offering fresh food because they're saying we, we bring it in we there, don't there, sell there, it. There, there's no yeah. incentive so no, if yeah. the federal government story, said what, your story was very striking thank you. I mm -hmm. stopped what I was doing yeah, and yeah. listened and, but, and, and, I, and you know we always run out of time on this show and I never get the chance to do the things that that need to be done like saying for example that this is an excellent story and there's several of them related and and it's at wbez.org you can uh, you can go to the to the website and and listen to the story and watch it and we should do that and Andy I, I think I also want to say to you and and say this very publicly that in the last year or so the website of the uh, Better Government Association has gone from being basically a static page saying, hey, want to send us some money, <laughs> to being a dynamic news uh, function in Chicago, and you sh you're to be congratulated for that. Well, it's thanks. That's uh, bettergov.org. Uh, I think the point is that you're talking about county government and city government. You know, we have too many people who believe that governments to be run for their benefit, too mm -hmm. many public officials, as right. opposed to a recognition that these are our tax dollars. Yeah. And so the whole point is to use civic engagement to, to bring in as many people as possible so that we can give them information and we can show them how to advocate, put the heat on public officials. And so this is phase one of a website that is ultimately, I hope, going to be a very strong advocacy tool. And yes, there'll be a donate button because we're a nonprofit and we need help. But at the end of the day, the real battle is to get people someplace where they can tell pu public officials what they think about behavior. And that's what we're hoping to do eventually. Well, one of the stories that's on your website right now, one of your investigations, and, and you also should be congratulated for actually hiring, you actually are hiring investigators. You've, you've got reporters working. But um, this thing about the, the city council, the size of the city council, which I found really fascinating, you, you actually kind of sat down and, and crunched the numbers and came up with the idea that we could probably have 25 aldermen and mm -hmm. wouldn't really affect Well, I think the point very. was, to put this in context, everybody's always griping about city council and saying that there are too many, and I don't know if that's true or false, but we thought it would be beneficial to take a look at how Chicago compared with other cities, just numerically. Mm -hmm. And just for example, you have New York with 51 council members uh, uh, serving an area of 8.4 million people. You have Chicago with the same number, roughly 50, serving 2.8 million. So in effect, 
every New York council member has three times as many constituents as a Chicago alderman. I'm not sure if that's good, bad, or indifferent, but no one is saying that Chicago is being run better than New York these days. Kitty is Actually, about to... Actually, I... I <laughs> you beg to beg differ. Beg to differ with Andy, <laughs> which is not that often, yeah. but I think you can't do a quantitative analysis on that alone. I think you need to do a qualitative analysis. I think you would need to spend send a reporter into a New York councilman's office to see the kinds of things they deal with in a week from a city services standpoint and a constituent services standpoint and send a couple reporters in to sit in in aldermen's offices here because I, I lived in DC I never lived in New York but the kinds of things that we call our aldermen for here which is pretty much everything I mean they're the line of first defense in Chicago that doesn't happen in other cities that you don't get city services through your alderman the but, way that we do and, and just, just a really Go funny ahead. anecdote i have a friend who's from chicago who lives in new york who is in the process of opening up a public art space in new york mm -hmm. and we were hanging out and he was like when did aldermen in chicago become so powerful because in the matter of one <laughs> evening alderman came up three times like well you need to check with your alderman on that yeah. <laughs> check with your alderman on that welcome because he was yeah. talking about licensing yeah. and comparing his yeah. experience and he was like People are just bringing up aldermen here. I had no idea that they had so much power. So let me just let me just say the goal. The, but the goal here was not to take a position. We're mm -hmm. not coming out for or against yeah. a smaller city council. But the issue comes up so often, and it's come up in the mayor's race. It's come up in aldermanic races. We just thought that at least some kind of numbers crunching was a good starting point. Now I'll tell you, Kitty, in, in, to answer your question, we're going to do a public forum on this, in which we actually discuss this in a more human sense. This was step one give people a little data, then do an idea forum where we actually have the pros and cons discussed, where people like you can come and actually disabuse us of the notion of equality here. No, what I would do is encourage you to take it a step further too, and I'm sure there's a few aldermen who would let you put somebody in their office for a day and just see what it's like. You know, see the number of calls that they handle, how they deal with it, what they have to deal with. You know, there is, something, there is something kind of so uniquely Chicago about this that we real Chicagoans are really loath to, to change it, I think. But there is a there is another phenomenon going on here, though, that the three one one system it really does kind of circumvent aldermen in Except a lot of ways. Except nothing When happens. the street lights are out, you don't call your alderman anymore. You call three one one. Well, that was another and, one of our stories. And then when, we, when street happens. lights are out, like right. when street lights are out too often. They don't they get are. fixed. Well, That's when right, right. I, I maybe I'm old fashioned because I call my <laughs> alderman and something happens. I call three one one and, and I never happens. hear. I call three one one. You have to get a ticket number. That's the There's thing they the don't secret. tell you. The secret is getting a ticket number. Have to get a ticket number to get out of here because <laughs> as you can imagine it's we're already past our time i really want to thank andy shaw from the uh, bga for being here today kitty kurth political activist and uh, operative and of course natalie moore from chicago public radio from wbez um, and also a quick reminder that here at can tv we're very proud of the fact that we've been we have been covering all of these mayoral campaigns even if they're not putting them on tv folks they're putting them on can tv and you can see them Sunday nights at 5 o'clock every Sunday night. There's another mayoral uh, campaign or uh, what do we call them, forums. There's every Sunday night right here on CAN TV, so make sure you do that. And, of course, you can watch us here at 6.30 every Thursday night. You know that. And you can also see us on um, Blip TV and, uh, well, let's see, you can get us on iTunes, all those <laughs> things. You know how to do it. We'll see you next time here on uh, Chicago Newsroom. Thanks for watching.